Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit here at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host, co-analyst, Dave Vellante. Dave, one of the things you can maybe overlook or forget about Snowflake sitting here in a room with 12,000 other people is that it's not that old a company. It was founded in 2012. It's, it's really in its adolescence. Yeah, they didn't hit my radar until like 2014 in the big data days, but the Cube started in Boston in 2010. And one of our first guests <laughs> is joining us today, so I'm excited. Oh, well with that, I'd like to welcome back to the Cube, Jeremy, Bur Jeremy Burton, the CEO of Observe Inc. Thank you so much for returning and being such a good friend to the Cube. Yeah, you're making me feel old. Cloud well, meets <laughs> big data, man. That was amazing. You know? We were the OG big data. We have wisdom. I like to say. Yeah, you know, a little bit. Yeah. Gray has. So, but, but it's true, you were the OG Snowflake partner. I mean, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your company as it, is at it, as it has evolved along with Snowflake too. Yeah, I mean, we were sort of predisposed to building on Snowflake. We, we had a couple of early Snowflake engineers. In fact, uh, Philip Unterbrunner, who worked on the Snowflake query engine, he has a, a session on Thursday, a little plug for, for Philip. Uh, who, who he's going to talk about how we built Observe on top of Snowflake, and so obviously he was a fa he's a co-founder at Observe. So we were sort of predisposed to we want to build something on Snowflake, and we, we also had a crazy Russian guy called Vadim Antonov, and Vadim, Vadim did a lot of the unstructured data support in Snowflake, and of course observability it's it's all sort of semi-structured, unstructured data. So we had a couple of early engineers that helped make that decision, um, and certainly Snowflake is much better today than it was back in 2017 when we started, so it was maybe a bolder decision back then than it was now, but in hindsight, you know, as we sit today, I think we're feeling pretty good about that decision. Yeah, I mean, it was a big bet at the time, I think. Mm -hmm. People were like, well, you know, where's your value add? Are you going to be, and then you remember the whole conversation about the whole cogs of cloud. You got to pay Snowflake, you got to pay AWS, and I think you had a, you had a good line. Well, people used to have their own power plants at their homes too. So. Yeah, I mean, we used to have wells in our back garden <laughs> yeah, and generators go. in our basement. <laughs> and uh, Well, some people still do, but <laughs> not many. And I think that's where, where we were coming from back then, which is, let's not look at where the market is today. Where's it going to be in 10 years' time? W will there be value in our engineering team building an analytic engine uh, in 10 years' time? And my view was, was no because we felt that customers are going to pay us for answering sort of higher level questions that they would have about their infrastructure or their applications or, 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 their, or their business. And if we could rely on someone else to do the hard work of the analytics and, and give them a, a few years to mature the platform, we figured like we'd be in pretty good shape. So. Well, we've always kept in touch. You've always been such a good friend of the Cube and a great supporter. And so we remember early on with Observe, you weren't going after those big gnarly like custom big enterprise deals. You even said yeah. specifically, we're not going after that. We're going to, we're going to hit some singles, yeah. you know, and, and 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 then grow. And now you're, you hit the big time here. Yeah, we got we got <laughs> some big ones. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, I was just watching a session by our, our biggest customer is Capital One, and I was just watching a session by them on on data lakes and iceberg table formats. Very popular yesterday yeah. and today, I've noticed. <laughs> um, and and they, they have been sort of instrumental in us being able to solve those enterprise use cases. And you know, we felt like, okay, let, let's not try and get 10 big customers on board at once, but if we could work with one and we could do a really good job, we would learn so much about how to be successful in the enterprise, we could then reproduce that you know, cookie cutter, uh, sell more banks, sell more large enterprises. So yeah, we, we, we started breaking into um, financial services and, and some of the bigger companies, whereas I think when we last talked, we were probably more startups and companies that looked like ourselves. Yeah, I think last time we talked, you were sort of on that trajectory. Yeah. And then, so what's different? You know, you got, you got product market fit, right? And then, yeah. you, and, then, and then you said, okay, before we scale, go to market fit, let's make sure that we can get product market fit with larger enterprises, right? That was kind of the, yeah. the sequence, and now you're scaling the company. Yeah, right? and, the, the, and there's a lot of sort of boring but really, really important things you need for large enterprise. So, for example, we ingest over 300 terabytes of data a day. Um, you know, when the early customers that we were ingesting, we didn't even know we could do a terabyte a day. And so now we, we do 300 and we've scale tested it up to a petabyte a day for a single customer. So, I mean, obviously, you know, data volumes are, are, are growing 40% a year, particularly unstructured data. So scale is, is still very, very important. 
Um, resiliency, you know, can we fail over the environment? That becomes important. Um, and then latency, um, can, can, what, what is the freshness of the data? Um, how long is it between the data being created and, my, and me being able to query it? If I want to debug my mobile application in near real time, what's the freshness of the data? Is it a minute is too long? Is it five seconds? Is it 10 seconds? What is it? So th these features are not like the sexy features that you would maybe show in a, in a demo, but they're features that you're, you're really not going to get into a large enterprise unless you can prove you can do. So when I think about your career, I go back to the the billboard right down the street, yeah. you know, no hardware agenda. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you, you've seen an evolution of the way in which we sell, the way in which we compensate salespeople, the, the metrics that you track. So what, what is, when, as you scale go to market, what do you, I, I presume you're looking really hard at retention, but I wonder if you could talk about how you think about success, ensuring that you've got, now you're beyond product market fit, but mm. what are you watching as indicators of success? Yeah, the, the, the hard thing about software is that you, 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 you cannot build a product for just one company or for 10 companies or even 100 companies. That, that's called a consulting company. Yeah. Which, there's, by the way, there is a very valid business in consulting, yeah. but they don't have the kind of multiples that our investors would expect. And so we have to build software that we can sell to tens of thousands of companies. And, Getting to market fit, I mean, a lot of startups talk about this. What does that mean? That means that we believe that we built something that we can sell to thousands of companies. And so when we bring in a salesperson, within six months or nine months, they should be able to get up to speed and do a million dollars. And then we should be able to hire another one and they should be able to do a million dollars. Easy. And so the, the hard bit, what we've been doing for the last six years is building the, you know, building the software and trying to get to that market fit. And, th and then the emphasis shifts a little bit from being it purely been about product to about scaling the go to market. And can we bring in another salesperson, another salesperson? Can we get them productive? Training becomes important. Can we get every new rep we bring in to get to that million dollar quota you know, within six to nine months of, of coming on board? And so obviously, what do we look at? We look at reps hitting the quota, that's a big one. We also look at uh, churn. You, you, you want to make sure that, okay, we sold this account a year ago, are they still with us? What's, what's that gross dollar retention? That's a big one for me. And ours currently runs in the 90s, so meaning 90% of the dollars that we got last year will, will renew this year. And then a big one, I don't know Snowflake probably set the high bar in history of this, net revenue retention. Yeah, NRR, right. And, and so our net revenue retention last year was, uh, was 174%. Oh, so wow. It was, it was pretty awesome. So that means that we have a product that we can sell, but also next year people will come back and they'll buy more. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, congratulations. So, yeah. <laughs> it's been so fun to watch this. You know, 70% of companies, Series A, B, and C, the failure rate's the same. Yeah. Right, I'm sorry, the failure rate of, of, yeah. of A, B, and C is the same as 70% of the companies fail. So your probability of succeeding was, you know, yeah. in the grand scheme of things, pretty low. So, um, so congratulations on that. So what's next for you guys? Um, yeah, so the, the big thing now is we, we just did a Series B. Um, Snowflake Ventures, actually, thank you very much. They're an investor in the company, so delighted. Delighted to have Snowflake on the cap table for many reasons. Uh, number one, obviously, it's a vote of confidence in the company. Number two, um, Snowflake have got business with a lot of large enterprises. They have relationships with companies that we could only dream of. And so it's nice for the Snowflake sales team to see that Snowflake would like to invest in Observe because we would like them to help introduce us to, to their customers. And I think we can you know, contribute pretty materially to burning down Snowflake credits. I mean, we do, we do about 120 million Snowflake queries a day. So, okay, so you're monetizing uh, yeah. with, those cre with that credit model, is that right? Or? Yeah, so we, we, we only put this in place in November, so it takes a little bit of time to get going. But the cool thing about it is if um, a Snowflake customer has, has made a commitment and um, they've got credits that uh, they would like to burn down, then obviously you can buy Observe and you can burn down your existing Snowflake credits using a connected app deployment. And, and how is the Snowflake rep compensated on that? Do you know? So they would, they would get uh, paid on the Snowflake credits that are burned down by Observe. Oh, so the, awesome. those 120 million queries, they're burning down Snowflake credits, the Snowflake oh, rep would get paid amazing. on that. So it's transparent. Yeah. What, you mentioned iceberg tables, it is a hot topic. How do you look at that? Do you look at that, Snowflake's positioning it as an opportunity, I presume you're saying the same, but explain it in the, 
Jeremy yeah. Burton fashion. No, I, I, I didn't, I must admit about a couple of years ago, I talked to Benoit about this, you know, and, and obviously Snowflake had great qu predictable query performance because it was uh, what, you know, like a walled garden. It was one environment and all the metadata that was um, stored with the tables helped the query engine go more quickly. And so back then it was always like, ah, this iceberg thing, is it going to work? Because it, it doesn't allow the, the Snowflake query engine to do the kind of magic that it does to give the query performance that you would need. Um, and anyway, wind the clock forward a couple of years and Iceberg has moved on as a standard. And I think this Polaris announcement that uh, Snowflake did on Monday is fantastic because all of the knowledge that the Snowflake query engine would need to do all of its magic, there's now a place for it uh, in the catalog. And so the potential here is that any query engine can run performantly against any table. And, and have all the technical metadata at its disposal. Right, right. so we're, we are very bullish, and I think in the large enterprise, there, there is a lot of inertia to move to this model whereby we're going to dump all of our data, telemetry data, obs you know, observability data, we're going to dump it in a data lake, and then uh, every application has got to pick it up and enrich it from there. And, and we, even from day one of Observe's sort of founding, we've never thought that collecting data or even storing data was a core um, differentiator. We, we believe that, that that should just be done by the infrastructure. Like, it, we, you know, another thing that I felt like over time that's going to commoditize. And, and so if, if Snowflake can help do that for us, then yeah, we'd much rather spend our time further up the stack helping people answer questions about their business. Same, do you have same philosophy on, on the governance of that data or is you've got to pick up at some point? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do think one of the real benefits of having all the data in one place, all in Snowflake, is we as a partner can piggyback off a lot of the core Snowflake value proposition. It's secure, uh, you've got governance over it, you can store it in an open data format. I mean, those are all things that we didn't create. And in fact, when we first started Observe, we created our own ingest pipeline because back in 2017, Snowpipe was just yeah, not very good. I remember that. Yeah. Well, uh, yesterday, it's actually, true we switched on Snowpipe streaming. Yeah. And so there's a good example of how if you bet on a platform, it might not all be there on day one, but over time, they solve more of the problem for us. So that code we had for our ingest pipeline, we threw that away. We now use Snowpipe streaming. Uh, our latencies went down from a minute to five seconds, and our costs went down. And so that, that, you know, that's why you build on, on a platform. And so that, that's not necessarily our innovation, but that then frees up our guys to innovate higher up. We, so, to yeah. double down on that, what is your innovation? Explain to the audience. Yeah, so what, what we do is when the data comes into Snowflake, um, we transform that data, like if you want to query or understand Kubernetes, for example, we have a whole bunch of transforms that uh, allow you to look at pods or containers or daemon sets, or if it's, if it's uh, data coming in from cloud trails, you can look at EC2 instances or you know, S3 buckets. Or if you've got a, an application, you can look at customers and sessions and transactions. And so that transformation of data and then the point and click interface to troubleshoot and analyze that data, that, that's really what we, that's our value add. Yeah. I'm curious as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a founder who yeah. clearly has a lot of foresight, when you, when you put your stake in the ground and said, you know, we're going to focus on observability here. This is going to become a challenge that, a lot, to, of, that to... a lot of companies are going to be facing is observability when, when you first started to observe a lot <laughs> way back when, what advice would you give to founders now about maybe an issue or a challenge that's really being overlooked when it comes to, to managing um, AI and, and managing data? I, I'd say uh, it's a great question actually, because I, I mean, as Dave well knows, I'd never done a startup before Observe, so I was learning as I went a little bit, but I think, you, you know, you, um, you've got to get very good at being comfortable with the unknown, um, you've got to make decisions based on the best information you have at the point in time, but then you've got to, you've got to be able to adapt. And if you can't react to things that are going on around you, you, you're probably going to make a mistake. You're going to go down a path that'll lead to a dead end. And so the hard thing is sort of living with that uncertainty. And um, I, I'd, I'd, I didn't have a whole lot of self-doubt in, in jobs that I've done in the past. I was always very confident. And I would tell you, I probably have more self-doubt in this job than in any job I've ever done because 
the right answer, you, you don't really know. And so you go in a little bit on experience and what your team feels, but you've got to be prepared to be like, all right, we went down that path, that, that was wrong, let's back up, and now, now let's go in, in this direction. But I, I would say like a North Star on the technical side is value always migrates north. Yeah. Right, so I mean, I, I started off in the storage world and that's, <laughs> that's in the basement. <laughs> and, and that's still a great business, by the way. But people pay more for databases, or there's more margin in databases than there is in storage. And there's probably, there is more margin in applications than there is in databases. And if you look historically, um, all of the database companies became application companies. And what it, why is that? Well, that's just an, a natural, migration of value, you've got to chase the dollars. And so if the new platform is based around AI, let's say, and the data for AI is in Snowflake, there's going to be a new range of AI applications that people create, and my guess is at some point, Snowflake will be end, end up in that business. So. Really interesting insights, yeah. because and of course, now you see NVIDIA is all the rage, and so the, the value does drop back down to the bottom of the stack, but there is going to be a shakeout in all the silicon investments that have occurred. I mean, everybody's raising, you know, you're a capital yeah. allocator as well. Sil semiconductors have always been a, a, yeah. a really cautious investment for folks. Now everybody's diving in. Yeah. It, it's not going to all end beautifully for everyone, you know, so. Yeah, I, I, and, and look, I think what's changed since um, I grew up, in my formative years, Intel dominated everything. Right. And so there wasn't like, the, the chip business was just a commodity and, and one company ruled it. And then this little company called Arm came along. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you could design custom chips. And TSMC gave you a custom fa a foundry to build those custom chips. And all of a sudden there was almost like a new hardware business because I could build custom chips specific for my application. And, and I think there's still going to be like a lot of that, but I'm, I'm still long on software, man. <laughs> well, and, and, and in a way, you're in a, good, you're in a good spot because you can apply AI to observe, but yeah. you don't have to become an AI, you know, I, I presume you're not going to your investor saying that we're an AI company now. You don't have to do no, that. I, I'm, uh, uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm, I, I'm actually a, a fan of generative AI. I'm, I question though, in the enterprise, okay, what's the use case and will people pay for it? So I love, I love having, an I have an assistant today. She is amazing, she's called Christy. I couldn't do my job without her. Like, she does much better when I train her to do certain things and th this is sort of how AI I think will go. It's like, it's an AI assistant, it's going to help me do things and it's going to help me be productive, but it doesn't do my job, right? And, it, and, and the thing is, the, the current technology, large language models, they don't have an ability to understand or to reason and, I, I, I think as a productivity improvement, they're going to be great. Uh, nobody ever read the documentation on anything we ever wrote. Now people will be able to get it through a chatbot. Fantastic, a chatbot that is right most of the time. Um, and then a co-pilot, that would be great because people need to learn a language in our product called Opal. If I don't know Opal, hey, I've, I've got an assistant, a co-pilot that's going to help me do it. Um, if I don't know what to do on an incident, I've got an assistant that's going to, hey, Jeremy, try this, do this. But it, it, to me, it's not going to figure out what the root cause of a problem is. But, and that's the big problem that people want to pay for, right? So how much will people really pay for these things? One question, and number two, how expensive is it going to be to train them to give you the answer? Very. Right, <laughs> so you know, when you hear that, oh, these foundational models are going to be $100 billion or whatever to train, are uh, like, oh my God, and, and what, they're going to be on consumer search sites for free? I mean, I'm no genius, but I know if you're giving something away for free that took $100 billion to train, you're probably not making money anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so something amazing is going to come out of it that is yeah. really hard to predict, or, yeah. you know, could... Well, I, I mentioned the other day to my good friend Nick Mehta, um, who's really into all of this, I said, Nick, I can't figure out whether AI is the next blockchain or whether it's the next cloud. The answer is probably somewhere in between the two. I think there's more use cases for generative AI than there is for blockchain. Cloud though, for me, um, I mean everything I talked about earlier about um, all the database companies becoming application companies, that was in the last era. Then the cloud came along and we're doing that all over again. So all the databases now are cloud databases. All the applications now are SaaS applications. So I think, I think AI's got to play. I'm sort of curious to see just 
how successful or how big the train wreck you're, is. You're Indeed. a bit of a contrarian here, actually quite a bit of a contrarian, because I yeah. think most of the narrative is, oh, it's going to far extend beyond cloud and PCs and yeah. cities gray hairs. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, you have wisdom. No, I, I, like I said, I'm, not, I'm, I'm like, I like the technology and I, I, we, we're using it today in the product. What I question is the underlying model and the hallucination and then the amount of money it takes to train other use cases where people will pay such that you can actually make a business out of it. That's yeah. what I've yet to be convinced of. Well, the ROI in, in, in consumer it's very obvious, if, if, if yeah. Facebook can build a bigger GPU cluster, they're going to sell more ads. But the ROI in, in enterprise, is not, it's very opaque at yeah. this point. Lots yeah, yeah. of, and lots I'm, of I'm important just, questions. I'm, I'm not smart enough to know the answer is all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well we're going to end on that note, Jeremy, That's why I come to talk bad. to people like Dave. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming. All right, thank a you. Great, a great well, conversation, as always. As always. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in, in enterprise tech news and analysis.